When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. I'm about to embark on a journey with you and show you many connections and revelations God has shown me throughout the past several years. Now before we start, we must get rid of the mental block of no man knows the day or the hour that Christ will come, or as that he comes as a thief in the night. And how people use these passages to say it is impossible to know when Christ is returning. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I know the day or the hour, but that we can know the seasons, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, that we are not children of the night, but of the day, so that he should not come as a thief in the night to us, because we are not asleep, but awake, keeping watch, so that we will know the season. So this is a call for the church to wake up. There's a reason there is so much Bible prophecy on end times. Actually, about a third of all Bible prophecy hasn't even been fulfilled yet. There's a reason why we as Christians are called to keep watch, which doesn't mean to look up at the sky 24-7, but to keep watch in the sense of signs, for there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, as Jesus said in Luke 21, and also the prophecy unfolding through the study of the scriptures. Now it is my duty to share what God has shown me, for as the scripture says in Luke 12, 48, quote, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected." End quote. And since I have been keeping watch, I am called to warn the church to wake them up, as it talks about also the job of the watchman in Ezekiel 33. Quote, if the watchman sees the sword coming, it does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. End quote. So I'm doing my part of witnessing to you. It is up to you to wake up. In this video, I'm going to primarily walk through the signs in the sun, moon, and stars while incorporating scripture. Just as the Magi, who were astronomers, were able to know when and where the Messiah Jesus Christ will be born by following the star. They were able to read the sign of the times in the heavens. Now, this amazing sign in the heavens of the star was only noticeable to those, as in the Magi, who knew what to look for because they were the only ones to notice it. We know this because for two reasons. Number one, they were astronomers. And for number two, King Herod asked them when they saw this star, as in he wasn't aware of it and the people probably weren't aware of it because he hadn't seen it, and we can reasonably say that if it was a supernatural event, this star, many people would have flocked to see the Messiah, not just the Magi. This event was most likely just some great astronomical sign. I mean, God is a God of numbers and cycles and the creator of the heavens, so it would make sense that God so aligned the heavenly bodies to, to cycle in a way that can be used as a calendar of biblical events to take place. So just as they were able to see the signs of the Messiah with the signs in the heavens, we should be able also to see the sign of the time of the Lord's return. In this video, I am going to be covering these signs, cycles, and calculations. I will be covering the tetra blood moons, the solar eclipses, and other heavenly body cycles, the birth of Israel, the Jubilee year calendar, the, the sabbatical year that God has given us, and much, much more. So please pay attention and prepare to be shaken. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, Ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly 
that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. He appointed the moon for seasons. The moon's orbit is actually not a perfect circle. It's in the shape of an ellipse. When it's closest to the Earth, we call it perigee. When it's farthest away from the Earth, we call it apogee. It's only a small difference, but it's enough to cause the moon to grow and shrink as seen from the Earth. Okay, now we get into some rare events with the moon. Each time a new moon happens, there's a chance that the moon will block the sunlight and cause a shadow to appear on a portion of the Earth. When this happens, it's called a solar eclipse. The reverse can also happen. Each time we have a full moon, there's a chance that the Earth will block the sunlight from reaching the moon. We call this a lunar eclipse. So now the question is, why don't we get a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse every month? As the Earth orbits around the Sun, we can map out a 2D plane that's referred to as the ecliptic. The Moon doesn't orbit on the same plane. It's tilted by about 5 degrees. This means that most of the time, the Moon passes above or below the Sun as seen from the Earth. We can map out two invisible points in space at which the moon's orbit crosses the ecliptic. We call these the lunar nodes. When they line up with the sun, earth, and moon, that's when a solar eclipse or lunar eclipse will occur. This is referred to as an eclipse season. These happen about twice a year. During an eclipse season, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to see anything. In the case of a solar eclipse, the moon may pass slightly above or below the sun and give us a partial solar eclipse. This won't really dim the sunlight enough for us to see it. When the moon entirely crosses the sun, we will be able to see it. If the moon is closer to apogee, then it will appear smaller and we'll get what's called an annular solar eclipse. If the moon is closer to perigee, then it will appear bigger and we'll get what's called a total solar eclipse. Even if you're lucky enough to be on the right spot on the Earth, the longest you'll be able to see a solar eclipse is about 7 minutes. You'll need to be under the umbra, which is the darkest part of the moon's shadow. For a lunar eclipse, the Earth is the one casting the shadow. We may see a partial lunar eclipse, or a total lunar eclipse. This can be seen from anywhere on Earth where it's night, and will last for several hours. For about an hour, the moon will appear red because of the sunlight bending around the Earth. This is where the term blood moon comes from. Okay, now that we know what a blood moon is, also known as a total lunar eclipse, we can now dive into what a tetrad is. A tetrad is a series of four consecutive blood moons in a row within about an 18 month window. A tetrad can happen anywhere from several times a century to none for a few centuries. What we are going to focus on is even more rare. That is tetrads that all land on Jewish feast days. Since the time Jesus walked the earth until present day, there have only been eight tetrads that coincide with these Jewish feast days. The first tetrad occurred on the Jewish Passover and Feast of Tabernacles in 162 to 163 AD, coinciding with the worst persecution of Jews and Christians in the history of the Roman Empire within three years of the Antonian Plague killing 8 million people. The second tetrad occurred 
on the Jewish Passover and Yom Kippur holidays in 1795 to 1796 AD, while King Charlemagne of the Roman Empire established a DMZ buffer zone between France and Spain, ending centuries of Arab invasions into Western Europe. The third tetrad occurred 48 years later on the Jewish Passover and Yom Kippur holidays in 1842 to 1843 AD. Shortly after the eclipses, the Vatican Church in Rome was attacked and looted by an Islamic invasion from Africa. The fourth tetrad occurred 19 years later on the Jewish Passover and Yom Kippur holidays in 860 to 861 AD. Shortly after the eclipses, the Byzantine Empire defeated Arab armies at the Battle of Lala Khan in Turkey and permanently stopped the Islamic invasion of Eastern Europe. The fifth tetrad happened 634 years later, landing on the Passover and Yom Kippur holidays in 1493 AD, which was one year after the Spanish Inquisition where the Jews were kicked out of Spain and also a year after Christopher Columbus, also a Jew, founded the Americas. The sixth tetrad occurred 457 years later, in the year 1949 AD to 1950 AD, which happened one year after the birth of Israel as a nation in the year 1948. Seventh tetrad occurred 19 years later in the year 1967 to 1968 AD, coinciding with the Six-Day War between Israel and Palestine. The Eighth Tetrad occurred 19 years later in the year 2014 to 2015 AD, just a few years before US President Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and announced plans to relocate the US Embassy there, upending seven decades of US foreign policy in a move expected to inflame tensions in the region and unsettle the prospects for peace. So here's a chart I made mapping out all the tetrad blood moons that land on Jewish holidays that I previously mentioned in detail. In this chart, I want to point out the sequence of years apart because man, are they significant. They are there to give further significance that God is trying to show us something here hidden in the cycles of the moon. Since the time Christ has walked the earth until now, there have been dozens of tetrads. But it is only these eight that I show you that all land on Jewish holidays. On a side note, I would like to point out the significance of there only being eight. Because it is only right now in this century, the 21st century, that there are eight tetrads to happen in this century alone. Every other century is either three, five, six, seven, or no tetrads at all. That in itself, I believe, is God telling us that this is the final century before Christ's return. But the more amazing thing that I want to point out, as you probably have already noticed, is the sequence of 19 years apart and 48 years apart mirroring each other as well. X marks the spot. 1948 is the year Israel was reborn. Wow, that can only be the handiwork of God. Remember, he guides the cycles of all the heavenly bodies very precisely and that they should be for signs and for seasons. I also love how God made the next one to be 567 years later, as if he is trying to tell us that this is it. From what we see in the world, how close the times are and everything, and what I'm going to show you further in this documentary, that there's no way that it's another 567 years away. This has, this to, has be to be it.
now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Hello everyone, my name is Christian Valancourt. I'm the maker, producer, and writer of this documentary, but really actually all the glory to God, he is the real maker, producer, and writer of this documentary, for he has revealed all these things to me. Anything that, could, that comes out of me is from, from the Father. So thank you, Lord, thank you. Now as a watchman, I just want to reveal these things to you as much as given, much as required. So first I want to dive into Matthew 24, um, verses 32 to 35 that I just shared with you of the prophecy of the fig tree. Uh, I quickly just want to reveal what it means and then after that I'll quickly go over and give the reasons why and fortify those reasons why as well. So before we begin to decode this parable of the fig tree, which you will see is an end time countdown clock, we need to identify what the fig tree is, what the parable means, when it says all these things have to take place within one generation, how long is a generation? Israel in scripture is identified symbolically and prophetically as a fig tree, and the only scripture to tell us the length of a generation is in Psalms 90.10, where it says that a generation is 70 years, but 80 years if it's strong. And we know that Israel is one of the strongest nations in the world, so we'll go with 80 years. So if a generation is 80 years, when do we begin this generation countdown? Well, Israel became a nation again in May of 1948, after not being a nation for almost 2,000 years. On May 14, 1948, Israel the fig tree was planted again. So you would add 80 years to 1948, it brings you to the year 2028. Now Jesus says in the parable that all these things have to happen before the generation is over, which we now know that a generation ends in 2028. All these things that Jesus is referring to is everything he explained in Matthew 24 that would happen prior to his coming. Well, in Matthew 24 up to verse 14, he describes the first three and a half years of the seven year tribulation, which I will explain later in the video. Then from verses 15 to 28, Jesus is talking about the midpoint of the seven year tribulation, which again, I will explain later in the video. All these things have to happen before those 80 years are up in 2028. So if the midpoint has to happen before May of 2028, that would mean the latest the seven year tribulation can start is three and a half years before May of 2028, which would be the fall of 2024. The seven year tribulation cannot start any later than the fall of 2024. The midpoint is also when the Antichrist reveals himself and the Jews realize that Jesus is the Messiah, so they run off into the wilderness to be protected by God for three and a half years the second half of the tribulation. That would be the fig tree fully blossomed. Then as the parable says, when all these things have taken place, you know that Jesus is near even at the door, and that summer is near, as in the harvest is near, and the rapture is when Jesus harvests his people from the earth. So in conclusion, the parable is not saying that Jesus has to return within 80 years from Israel becoming a nation again. It is saying that the midpoint of the seven year tribulation has to be within 80 years of Israel becoming a nation again. Then after the midpoint, we know that he, as in Jesus, is coming soon. And another key reason why we know that Israel is the fig tree, as it explains in Jeremiah 24, that um, the Bible often uses the fig tree to describe the abundance of the land of Israel. So now we're also going to look at Jeremiah 8.13, where it's a prophecy about the cursing of the fig tree, talking about the curse, the curse that comes upon Israel, prophesied in Jeremiah. And where do we connect that to? Well, when Jesus was hungry and saw a fig tree and went to go get a fig, and it was bearing no fruit, like Israel was at the time, a very dead and unbelieving nation. Um, and so he cursed the fig tree and, and it withered away. And so we know that Jesus wasn't just hungry and because he was bearing no figs that he got angry and cursed the tree. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. He has a reason for everything he does. And so the cursing of that fig tree as we see when we tie it with other scripture paralleling with Israel as the fig tree, that he's clearly talking about the curse that is about to come upon Israel. And it's also interesting because that curse that he's talking about, we can see now, looking back from history, that in 70 AD there was destruction at the temple, which was, and then they were scattered around the world, and um, 
even recently with the six million Jews that were killed in the Second World War. But I also like to point out that in the beginning of Matthew 24, he's talking about the temple and how no stone would be left upon another. And that ties in perfectly with the, in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple that came shortly after Jesus' Jesus's death on the cross. So it all ties together. That we, we can be confident now that Israel is this victory that it's talking about. And when you see the timelines I'm about to reveal to you, we can also be confident that 80 years from 1948 to 2028, the midpoint of, of 2024 to 2031, fits perfectly. But then even I had my doubts that it, maybe this prophecy of the fig tree isn't talking about Israel. And that's when God showed me something. He showed me the blood moons. And then 1948, as we saw there, it was all hidden within the moons. Sign, signs in the sun, moon, and stars. How amazing is that? That's the handy work of God. Now I'm just going to quickly show you a few of the verses, and then I'll show a quick video clip illustration to help you further grasp everything that I just shared with you. God bless. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. But thus says the Lord, like the bad figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten, so will I treat Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his officials, the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a reproach, a byword, a taunt, and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. And I will send sword, famine, and pestilence upon them until they shall be utterly destroyed from the land that I gave to them and their fathers. From this prophecy in Jeremiah 24, we can clearly see that the figs are represented by Israel. Now that we've got that covered, there are two verses in this that I would like to point out, and that is where he says, Then I will give them a new heart to know me, that I am the Lord. This sounds something like the many of the new covenant promises in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. It is better to regard it as using the gathering from exile as a prefiguring of the ultimate fulfillment of the promise in the last days. From a Christian perspective, we know that the new covenant was not instituted in the return from exile because Jesus Christ specifically instituted in his work on the cross. Nevertheless, the return from exile did foreshadow the new covenant in some important ways. God's people were gathered again into the land, and they were a changed people. I would also like to point out the verse where he says, And a curse in all the places where I shall drive them, and I will send sword, famine, and pestilence upon them, until they shall be utterly destroyed from the land that I gave to them and their fathers. We can also see the, the foreshadowing of that not only from the exile from their land into Babylon, but also the foreshadowing of the exile from 70 AD, when they were scattered about all across the world and they've been persecuted since, as we covered in the, the Blood Moons. I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the tree, and their leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. Early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. The cursing of the fig tree is not to be confused with the fig tree prophecy. They are two separate events. What links them together is the simple fact that Jesus picked the fig tree as a picture of Israel. The cursed fig tree was a picture of Israel that was fruitless and therefore useless. It was cursed. 
The parable of the fig tree, on the other hand, is a picture of the fig tree coming back to life. In other words, Israel is reborn and will produce fruit and be a light to the nation, just as prophesied. The Revelation is 12 sign. This sign that happened in the heavens on the eve of September 22nd to the eve of September 23rd is one of the most glorious and significant signs God has given us. It's in complete alignment with prophecy given in Revelation 12, which has never aligned this precisely since time began. It is of such significance that if you research it, you'll find that many outlets, news outlets, even the Washington Post, try to discredit it. You can see that Satan's at work trying to cover up this glorious sign that is just so obvious. They'll try to discredit it by telling you that the Sun, Moon, and Jupiter um, align with Virgo every 12 years, which is correct, but that's where they stop. They forget to mention that Jupiter was in the belly of Virgo for 9 months, then came out between the legs once everything else was aligned, or how the three planets with the 9 stars of Virgo also perfectly align to make a crown of 12 stars. What also makes it ex extremely significant is the timing of the alignment happening at the end of the Jewish New Year, 5777 which seven has big implications biblically and is biblically the number of completion. Also the Jewish holiday it lands on is called the Feast of Trumpets and the trumpets are blown as a warning call of impending danger. Now as I said it's a sign like when you go down the road and you see a sign warning you of something ahead so it doesn't mean something was supposed to happen on that day but a warning of something to come. As it also happening on the eve of the Feast of Trumpets, trumpets are a warning of something to come. It is also interesting to point out that it happened 70 days, seven, after the attack of the Temple Mount that happened on July 14th, 2017, July being the seventh month, and, the, and 14 is divisible by seven. There's actually a lot of numbers around this date of September 23rd that keep adding up to the number seven. Here's a short video explaining the Revelation 12 sign, but before I show it, I also want to make it clear that I know that Revelation 12 is talking about spiritual events of Israel. But prophecy doesn't always have just spiritual implications, but also has physical implications as we now know from this precise alignment. Hello and welcome. Today I want to briefly discuss with you a very important topic in which the sun, the moon, and the stars will align with perfection to fulfill a 2,000 year old prophecy. Perfection only found from the creator of heaven and earth. This prophecy was written down in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Holy Bible, directly from Jesus. This book was given to us so that we would know the time of the end, what to expect, and to know what would happen. Let's read Revelation 12 together. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So what we see written here is the constellation Virgo, which is known as the woman, who is clothed with the sun. That means the sun is currently in the constellation Virgo. The moon is under her feet and above her head is a crown of 12 stars. And Jupiter enters her belly, stays there for nine months, and exits, showing a birth. So in this very descriptive passage, we see all phases, the sun, the moon, and the stars, all coming together to form a picture of a birth. And again, lastly, the nine stars from Leo, always above her head, plus the three wandering stars aligned perfectly for the crown. God himself spoke through the prophet Daniel and said these things would be sealed up until the time of the end, as in nobody would really understand until the end came. Thanks to technology, we have a program called Stellarium. It allows us to go forward and backward in time and see how the stars align. Because as they have seen, every star, every planet known as a wandering star follows a mathematical equation. This alignment has never happened. In the beginning, in the book of Genesis, God himself says the sun, the moon, and the stars will be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and for years. This prophecy is no exception. What's also really interesting is when Jesus was telling his apostles of when he will return, he himself said that there would be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations, as in 
much trouble going on as we see now. Hopefully by now you see that this topic is worthy of your time for further investigation. I also just want to add that Jupiter is known as the king planet, so Virgo, the Virgin, Mary, pregnant with the king, Jesus, see the, how it lines up there, but also in this picture you see that there's a comet that passed through that came from the constellation Leo, Leo the Lion of Judah, God, it came and met with Jupiter just before the moment of conception in November, and it's interesting too because a comet does slightly look like a sperm, so there you have it, all fitting together, impregnating the woman, the moment of conception in November of 2016, and then nine months later, giving birth, where Jupiter, the king planet, comes back out between the legs. So you're probably wondering what this warning sign in the heavens is for and when it is for. I believe it's for the seven year tribulation that is about to come upon us the last week of Daniel. And I believe that it is also for seven years in the future that we're given seven years of warning. Because when a warning comes, as this one did in 2017, it's not impending something that's gonna happen in the year 3000. Usually when a warning comes, it comes right before whatever it's warning about. I believe the best answer we can find in the scripture is of when Joseph was in the land of Egypt and he was given a dream vision of seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. The seven years of famine would be the seven year tribulation and then that would mean that there's a seven year warning. So you add seven years to 2017, that would bring you to 2024. So that seven years from 2017 to 24 to 2024 is the seven years of plenty. Plenty as in what? Back then it was grain, storing grain, but now that we're after Christ, this is the bread of life. and that that seven years of plenty would be of the prophecy that God has given us, these warnings, these signs, and the explosion of the gospel through the internet and by other means. And now I'm going to show you another sign that has happened in the heavens with the sun that also just helps fortify the reason behind a seven-year warning. The total solar eclipse that happened on August 21st, 2017 has so many series of sevens and amazing facts that I simply won't be able to cover them all. For the sake of time, I'm going to cover the most important ones. So first of all, the date is significant in of itself. It happened on the 21st, which is 7 plus 7 plus 7, and happening in August 21st, 2017, August the 8th month. So 8 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 0 plus 1 plus 7 equals 21 which is seven plus seven plus seven. The eclipse happened exactly seven months to the day after Trump's inauguration. And on his inauguration, Trump was 70 years old, seven months and seven days. It's also interesting just to play on words with Trump's name, as in Trump, we talked about trumpets. What does a trumpet mean? A warning happening in 2017 of the 2017 sign and warning. 2017, also the year that Trump recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and creating the Temple Coin. 2017 also being the year 5,777 in the Jewish calendar and also being 21 days from 9-11 when the two towers were attacked. The 2017 eclipse happening in the 70th year of Israel becoming a nation again. The 2017 eclipse also passed through 14 continental U.S. states, which is 7 plus 7. The eclipse also passed through seven cities named Salem. The first city that it passed through when it entered the United States was Salem. Now, Salem has great significance because it is a derivative of the word Jerusalem. Salem means peace. So could this mean God warning about taking away the peace from America, a peace from the world? And the next solar eclipse to happen after the 2017 solar eclipse is in the seventh year after the 2017 eclipse on April 8th, 2024. The last time a total solar eclipse crossed the United States from coast to coast was 99 years ago in 1918. And what followed that? The Spanish flu that killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide. It is also interesting that this solar eclipse of 2017 cuts right through the middle of America as it's dividing America. And aren't we seeing that now with the way that America is? Another interesting thing to point out that right in the center, K 
Kansas City and St. Louis that it passes over two major cities happen to be right on the borders of their state. The state border runs right through the center of it, dividing the city, as we just talked about the dividing of America. Now where do these two paths of totality intersect? Where does X mark the spot? Well, it's over a little village called Maconda in Illinois. That same village, also in the early 20th century, used the slogan, the Star of Egypt. Now I wonder what that means. It sounds pretty significant, but if you really want to get right down to where they intersect in Maconda, Illinois, it happens to be just a few hundred meters away in a field from a road, as you probably guessed, named Salem. And you know what? That's just a predicted path that could change by up to a few hundred meters, as I've found through research. So it could land just right over top of that road called Salem. It's also interesting to note that if you subtract six years, six months, six weeks, and six days, all sixes, you know where I'm going with this, from April 8th, 2024, it brings you to August 21st, 2017. So the two eclipses are exactly six years, six months, six weeks, six days apart. If God had to make signs to wake up the church, I don't think we could get more of a sign. This is more than any generation that we have seen. We're going to talk about the American uh, solar eclipse. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about the word sign. God gives signs. How many of you believe that? Yeah? God gives signs. Christians do not even pay attention to the signs that the Bible is talking about. But the Jews do. To the Jews, a constellation is a sign because the word sign means constellation. Gematria is considered among Jewish rabbis a sign. The way we read the Bible is considered very surface level, which is good. You need to understand what the text says. That's not wrong. But the rabbis who spend all their life studying the word of God want to know what's in the subtext, want to know what's in the gematria, because in the Jewish mentality, this leads to that. Something that has the same sign leads to the other thing. Something that has the same gematria leads to another thing. And that's how they study the word. Again, this is completely lost among most Christians. This is a sign includes things in the sky and gematria. Now, we want to come to a, another sign. Something that the Jews would consider a sign in the sky, which is the total solar eclipse that is going to cross the United States mainland on the 21st of August, 2017. So the Bible says, first of all, the sun and the moon are up in the sky for signs. Then the Bible says the disciples ask for signs. So the sun is a sign, the moon is a sign. How so? Let's take a look at this. Do you realize that a total solar eclipse is only possible on Earth? No other planet that we know, certainly no planet that we're aware of in the solar system, can experience a total solar eclipse. Why is that? Because the sun's diameter is 400 times larger than the moon's, but at the same time, the sun also happens to be 400 times farther away than the moon. Well, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Tav. Everyone say Tav. Tav. And the letter, or this letter is associated with the image of a sign. It means a sign. And guess what? Its gematria value is 400. Why would you say that a sign has the numerical value 400? Because the person who made the Hebrew alphabet made the sun and made it 400 times bigger in diameter than the moon and put it 400 times away so that they could perfectly cover, the moon could cover the sun perfectly because the two disks sometimes will look exactly the same size. That's a sign. On the fourth day, he made that sign. He gave it a value 400 and he put the distance 400. He made the size 400 bigger. Some people won't accept this. A lot of Christians are not taught this, so they'll say, oh, it's just a coincidence. As the rabbis say, and I'll quote, coincidence is not a kosher word. There is no coincidence with God. It's a God incident. So he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So even to the evil generation, he says, I'm still going to give you one sign. What was that sign? Take a look at it. Today, Nineveh is called Mosul. So there's Mosul right there. And there was a total solar eclipse that crossed the north of Nineveh on the 15th of June, 763 BC, during the reign of King Asher Dan III. This was one of the omens which led Nineveh to repent wholesale. Before Jonah arrived, it wasn't because he was such a great preacher. It was because the hearts of the people had been prepared through a series of omens and signs. The greatest of which, the most objective of which, was the solar eclipse passing almost directly overhead their city. 
You're out in the middle of the day and it suddenly turns dark, you pay attention. Say, what's going on? And the ancients were not so dumb. Dubbed the Burr Sago Eclipse. It was one of the most famous solar eclipses in ancient history. In other words, when Jesus said there was a sign given during the time of Jonah, it wasn't that long ago in history from Jesus' perspective. And this sign was well known to the entire secular world. Why? Because it was recorded in cuneiform tablets called the Assyrian Eponym Canon. And this is something that was on earth in the 19th century. But back in those days, that was textbook stuff. That was child, like children's education. And when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and said, you'll get one sign left. You're so resistant. You're so stubborn. I'll give you one sign. And you know what happened when Jesus was crucified? The sun turned to darkness. The Bible records it. Even if you're a Christian and you say, no, the sign of Jonah is only the resurrection, I understand your interpretation. I agree with it. But don't discount the fact that the sun turned to darkness. They turned to darkness, which confirmed for those Pharisees who were watching at that time. Didn't he say something about the sign of Jonah? And when Jesus is crucified, the earthquakes, day turns to night. The sign of Jonah included at least five things. When you trace the history of the reign of Asher Dan III, you find that there were a series of plagues, civil wars, military loss, a major earthquake, and a total solar eclipse. If you look right now in America, it's almost like there is a civil war that's about to start. The division between people in America is almost 50-50, right down the line. On the 21st of August, 1914, a total solar eclipse crossed Eastern Europe. This was dubbed at that time the World War I eclipse. World War I started two months prior to, the prior to the solar eclipse with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand on the 28th of June, 1914. Also, the final Hebrew month, Elul, begins at sundown on which day? Monday, the 21st of August, 2017. What's Elul about? Here it is, Wikipedia says, Elul is the 12th month of the Jewish civil new year. It comes from the Akkadian word, they say, that means harvest. There's a sign, a marker on the earth. 33 days before the Revelation 12 sign. Interesting number. Which will then, we're not even done, which will then be followed by another total solar eclipse seven years later. The sun is a sign to the Gentiles or the nations. The sun is bigger. The moon is smaller. The moon is a sign to the Jews or the nation of Israel. The solar eclipse seems to be a warning of judgment on the Gentile or on the Gentile nations. Now take a look at this. If you impose superimpose the path of totality over the earthquake hazard zones, it's like a, like a perfect match. Starts from one subduction zone and goes over to the new Madrid zone. This is FEMA's earthquake, projected earthquake damage zones. The red would be the worst. Yellowstone's there, new Madrid's there, and the sun marks it out. On the 21st of August, the sun says, we're crossing all of those earthquake zones. So we now see the first total solar eclipse crossing the United States in 2017. And then there's going to be a second total solar eclipse crossing the United States seven years later, on the 8th of April, 2024. First of all, what's interesting about the 8th of April is it just so happens, if you believe in coincidence, it just so happens to be the first of Nisan, year 5884. Nisan is a religious holiday. It's a moed. A moed. We talked about the moedim, the feasts of the Lord. This is a feast this is an important day, Nisan the first, the religious new year. So you put those two together, it looks like there's a cross there, a bullseye. And what is that, that bullseye? It's very interesting, it's the New Madrid seismic zone, but not only that, if you look carefully at the map, you see several states have a boundary that's been defined by two rivers. You see that? It's the Mississippi, the big one, and the small one is the Ohio. So it crosses, that cross, that X marks the spot, goes right over the, uh, the seismic zone, and it goes over the place where the rivers meet. Now why is this interesting? Because the rivers divide the land into three at that part. Now, the Bible says in Isaiah 18 verse 7, in that time, referring to the end time, a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth of skin, whose land the rivers divide. Whose lands the rivers divide divide. The Ohio and the Mississippi rivers join at exactly where the paths of totality, totality cross each other. Revelation 16 verse 17 talks about the seventh bowl. This is the very end of the predictions of Revelation. 
Then the seventh angel poured out his, seventh, his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Verse 19, Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Verse 20, the final event, and great hail, that's meteorites, fell from heaven upon men. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Now to conclude with the information just shared about the solar eclipses of 2017 and 2024 crossing the states dividing America, where they intersect over the new Madrid fault line and over these two major rivers as you see here, dividing the USA into three parts. It's interesting to note that the two major cities the eclipse of 2017 passes over are Kansas City and St. Louis City, which are divided in half by the state line, have similar river patterns in them which run the dividing line. Now as I mentioned earlier, where the two eclipses exactly intersect in Maconda, Illinois, that they went by the slogan Star of Egypt. The Star of Egypt is serious and is correlated with the goddess Sopte, which is known for the bringer of the new year and bringer of the flood from the Nile River. Now I know Soap Day is a false idol, but God can use anything to get a message across. Now we may not know exactly what God is telling us, but the signs are there and the warning is clear. One can only speculate. God first destroyed the earth and rebirthed it by a flood. Next he's going to destroy, destroy it and purify it by, it by fire. fire. As I'm about to show you, God has used solar eclipses as signs before. This is going to show how God has used solar eclipses to communicate his plan, and we can expect he will do so again. If he did this in the time of Joshua, that gives greater significance to the eclipses that are happening in 2017 and 2024. Now around July of 1406 BC, the same year the Jubilee Count began, Joshua commanded the sun and moon to stand still while Israel defeated the Amorites. However, there was another celestial sign left unrecorded that occurred about the same time. On July 14, 1406 BC, interesting date again, July 7th month, 14th day, 7 plus 7, 1406 BC, 7 7. At the front paws of the constellation of Leo, the Lion of Judah, an actual total solar eclipse occurred. Now, if you compare this solar eclipse that happened in 1406 BC with the one that happens in 2017 and 2024 you will see in this diagram how the solar eclipse is at the same area of the paws of Leo. On July 14th 1406 BC as Israel fought the Amorites the path of the moon's narrow shadow ominously crossed some very important places in one long curved length. It began near the place Columbus would later sail home after discovering America, passed through Spain, then over the seven hills of Rome, then the Greek gods of Mount Olympus, the island of Patmos, along with the seven churches of the Book of Revelation, Tarsus, then along the southern side of the northern border of Israel, where Joshua's long day war occurred. This includes Mount Hermon of Basham, where the watcher angels rebelled, it then continued along the Euphrates River to Babylon, Ur, and Eridu, which is also the Tower of Babel, on out the mouth of Euphrates, the easternmost border that God promised to Israel, and Susa of Persia, and then finally ends at Bombay, India, the great Hindu metropolis. Hey guys, as we approach the seven year tribulation and what commences afterwards of us, the church, entering the promised land, what does that remind you of? It reminds me of when Joshua, in 1406 BC, entered the Promised Land with the Israelites. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come, as everything is in the Bible. So what is the great significance with the eclipse of 1406 BC happening when Joshua entered the Promised Land with the eclipses of 2017 and 2024? Well, I think the key is is the years apart. If you go 70 times 7 times 7 it equals 3430. Now as you guessed it, from 1406 BC to 2024 
and is exactly 3,430 years apart. Or in other words, 70 times 7 times 7 years apart. Now that may not seem too significant in and of itself, but when you put it in the grand scheme of this whole documentary and, and its dates, it gives greater importance that God is trying to show us something. God has planned everything out. There is no such thing as coincidence. If it is exactly 70 times 7 times 7 years apart, there's got to be a significance to this eclipse. Genesis chapter 1 In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. 
and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now we're going to look at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1, and how in the creation narrative there is a cryptic deeper message hidden within the scriptures about how God declares the end from the beginning. Now that is interesting because in Isaiah 46.10 it says that God has declared the end from the beginning. So from that we can know that within the beginning of the scriptures there must be a hidden message declaring the end from the beginning. Now the Lord said that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. He says this in 2 Peter 3 verse 8. Now on the surface we know that God is just describing that time is irrelevant to him. He could have used any set of numbers to describe how he isn't bound by time, but God is so precise that everything has meaning and purpose. There is no coincidences with God. He uses those numbers of a day is like a thousand years for a reason. That reason becomes evidently clear when you apply it to the seven days of creation. For in six days he created everything and he rested on the seventh day. Now each day is a, as a thousand years applied. That makes the six days of creation, six thousand years, God will work and contend with man. And for the last day where he rested is as a thousand years where we will reign with Christ in the millennial reign as spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. Now what further fortifies this revelation is the fact that God said that he would only contend with man for 120 years. He speaks of this in Genesis chapter 6. Now why would God say he would only contend, which means struggle, wrestle, work with man for 120 years? Clearly he wasn't talking about the length of a man's lifespan, where there's nowhere in history where the lifespan of man has been majoritively around 120 years. There's got to be a deeper reason. It all begins to make sense when you turn those 120 years into 120 jubilee years. A jubilee year is described in Leviticus 25. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. So if a jubilee year is every fiftieth year, and you multiply it with the 120 years that God has decreed for man, so 50 times 120, it equals 6,000. You get 6,000 years, which fits perfectly with the timeline. Things here are about to get a lot more interesting and more concretely foolproof as we go over this chart here. As you see in this chart, the seven days of creation and how we applied the thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. Well, the events that have happened in the last 6,000 years correlate so well with the six days of creation. For example, in the first thousand years, what happened? Adam and Eve fell from the Garden of Eden, eating the forbidden fruit, knowing good and evil, darkness and light. We fell into sin, our darkness. We were separated from God, the light, as God separated the darkness and the light. But there's one thing that I really want to point out. 
When you get to day four, 4,000 years in, that's when Jesus came. He was known as the light of the world. And even John said, for light has come into the world. Now what did God do on the fourth day? He created the two greater lights, the sun and the moon. And what's interesting is how well that correlates because if Jesus is the light of the world, he represents the sun because he is the son of God. And then the moon, the lesser light, reflects the light of the sun. So the church starts and we reflect Jesus's light because Christ now lives inside of us and we become that beacon of light, reflecting his light as he lives inside of us. Now, the last thing I want to point out as you look down at the bottom of the chart is the story of Moses directly parallels the Jubilee cycles of the earth. Moses saved them from bondage of slavery when he was 80 years old. Then they wandered in the wilderness for another 40 years, groaning and wanting to return back to Egypt before they entered the promised land by Joshua when Moses was 120 years old. In the same way, Jesus saved us from bondage of sin at the 80th Jubilee, 4,000 years in when Jesus came. We have now been wandering in the wilderness and groaning for 40 Jubilees, 2,000 years, wanting to get to the Promised Land, which we will do at the 120th Jubilee. There are a lot of more things that go in with this chart here, but there just simply wouldn't be enough time. But I've covered enough of the basics to make it undoubtedly clear that the Lord has declared the end from the beginning. There is a set time that the Lord is going to end this earth. And if we could figure out when Christ was going to come through the scriptures, why couldn't we figure out when he's going to come back through the scriptures as well? In no way am I saying I know the exact day or hour that Christ is going to return. But as the scriptures say, we will know the season if we keep watch. And why would God give us so many things to look for and so many signs in these times to point out, to say, hey, I'm here, I'm coming. And us to be in doubt and think, oh, it could be a thousand years from now, it could be a hundred years from now. No, I think we can know the season, the final seven years. In the year 1217, a rabbi by the name of Judah ben Samuel made an astonishingly accurate prediction. He went on to prophesy about 10 jubilees that would take place and the events that take place with them. He first said that for eight jubilees, that Jerusalem would be ruled by the Ottoman Turks. And then for one jubilee, Jerusalem would be a no man's land. And then after those nine jubilees, the Jews would regain control of Jerusalem. And then after one more jubilee, the messianic era would begin, the end times. Judah ben Samuel also died in the year 1217. But astonishingly, exactly 300 years later, in the year 1517, the Ottoman Turks took rule of Jerusalem. They took rule of it for exactly 400 years, which is eight jubilees. For we know that a jubilee is 50 years, so eight times 50 equals 400 years. That rule ended in 1917. Under the British mandate, it was considered a no man's land. And then exactly 50 years later, one jubilee, in the year 1967, the Jews regained control of Jerusalem after the Six Day War. And then exactly one jubilee later, 50 years later, he predicted that in 2017, the messianic era would begin, the beginning of the end times. Which is amazing because that exactly aligns with our timeline of 2017 and then seven years of plenty, 2024, the beginning of the seven year tribulation to 2031. And the the signs that happened in the, in the skies in 2017, warning of what's to come.
Malachi Morgair was the first Irish saint to be canonized by a pope. He was known to, to have some supernatural miracles associated with him. He's most famous now for his prophecy of the popes. In 1139, Malachi made a pilgrimage to Rome to visit the pope. While ascending one of the city's fabled seven hills, he was struck by a revelation from God. And the story goes that he fell into a trance all that night. He would mention these Latin phrases. Di meditate lune, flows florum, passer et nautua, di labora solis. Each one of these Latin phrases would match up to the reign of a particular pope. And in that vision, he saw 112 popes up until the, the tribulation time, till the end. Malachi didn't just predict the number of popes before the end of the world, he also predicted who they would be with startling precision. And what you find is an accuracy, I would say, that exceeds 80%, which I can tell you that got me fascinated by these prophecies and that he's one of the greatest prophets I've ever encountered. And what makes it amazing is he gets more accurate as he gets to the end of the list. In fact, some of the ones more recently are quite astonishing. You have Benedict XV, who is called by Malachi, religio depopulata, which means religion devastated or depopulated. In his reign, the Christian faith was decimated. 25 million people dying from World War I. It's also the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And scholars say that 200 million left the Russian Orthodox Church to join the Communist Party. Religion depopulated. After him comes the papal giant, John Paul II, who is called De Laboris Solis, which means the sun's labor through eclipse. He was born in 1920 on a total eclipse. Then when he died, he was actually buried during a solar eclipse as well. Obviously, people can't manipulate eclipses, so apparently Malachi really did see a vision of the future, and it would, it, you would have to be divinely inspired, I would say, for it to, to match that accurately. That seems to be a little more than coincidence. Malachi's prophetic precision continues with the current pope, Benedict the 16th. Number 111, the final numbered motto, and that is de gloria olive, the glory of the olive or from the glory of the olive. There is a group of Benedictines called the Olivetans. Their symbol is the olive branch. The glory of the olive would be the highest ranking among them, and there he is. We thought, Malachi's correct again, and now there's only one more pope in the line. We are very close to the end of this prophecy. The prophecy goes on to say of a supposed final pope, the 112th pope, as St. Malachi said, and I quote, In the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep in many tribulations, and when things are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. The end. So this 112th Pope is going to be the one that exists during the final seven years that goes into the tribulation period. And possibly could be the false prophet that gives rise to the Antichrist. Now Pope Francis is the 112th Pope, but how does his name fit the name that Malachi gave, Peter the Roman? Well, in this clip by Tom Horn, he will explain. Peter, that in fact the only thing that it would take to fulfill the prophecy would be a cardinal of Italian descent. And lo and behold, George Bergoglio, Italian descent, both parents full-blooded Italians, or in the old language, Romans. But he names himself after Francis of Assisi. Now this is a Catholic friar who lived uh, in the late 1100s and the early 1200s, but his name of birth was Giovanni Pietro, Di Pietro, Peter de Bernardone. He was an Italian or a Roman in the old language, a man whose name can literally be translated Peter the Roman. So to take that as a namesake, well, it was intriguing to say the least. 
Now we can see how Pope St. Francis fits as the 112th Pope called Peter the Roman. But there is some speculation that Pope St. Francis wasn't actually properly elected, and so he's not actually a real Pope, as explained in this video. Um, I believe that Pope Francis was not canonically elected. I believe some hanky-panky went on in the conclave. And in fact, I think that even has something to do with why he picked Francis of Assisi as his namesake. His real name's Bergoglio, as you know. Um, because Francis of Assisi prophesied about the final pope. And he said he will not be canonically elected. Now that means that he's a placeholder for reasons that we can't quite figure out. But I believe he's going to either be removed from office or he's going to step down like Benedict did soon. And the guy that comes up to take his place is actually going to be the real Pope number 112 by election, Petrus Romanus. Now, and that means? The people that actually, some of the cardinals that voted for uh, Pope Francis now want him to step down. They've published this. It's in the news. They want him to step down, and they want him to be replaced by the uh, Secretary of State at the Vatican, whose name literally means Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman, right? Um, the, the two major Catholic media outlets, yeah. news outlets, uh, they recently interviewed the Pope's personal secretary, yeah, uh, Archbishop Gonswin, and they asked him, what do you make of the prophecy of the Pope's? He said, it gives us shivers. He admitted that he and Benedict and Pope Francis have, are all looking at the prophecy of the Pope's and that it is concerning to them. They see it as a sign, right? Well, why now, the, the, something that's never happened before, some of the leaders in the Vatican convened a recent meeting on how to depose a heretical pope. Hmm. They recently had this meeting, actually studying how to do it, right? If it comes to that. Last but not least, I would like to point out a prophecy given in Revelation 17, where it talks about seven kings that are to come. Five are fallen, one is, and then one is to continue a short space, the seventh, and then the eighth to come, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven and goeth into perdition, controlled by Satan. Now what's interesting about these eight kings prophesied in Revelation 17 is how well they fit with the Saint Malachi prophecy. Now I do believe that the prophecy of these eight kings does have a different prophetic meaning, but as we do know from prophecy, there can be dual meanings. Now what I find interesting here is how well it aligns with the Saint Malachi prophecy. Because if St. Malachi prophesied that the Pope that we have now, St. Francis, or maybe he wasn't properly elected, so someone that's going to replace him, is the 112th Pope, the last Pope. St. Francis is also the 8th King over the Vatican, which would be the last King. So it aligns with the last Pope of St. Malachi's prophecy. Now how is he the 8th King? Well. In 1929, Vatican City's independent sovereignty was recognized by the fascist Italian government in the Lateran Treaty. Sovereignty is exercised by the Pope upon his election as the head of the Roman Catholic Church. He has absolute executive, legislative, and judaical powers within the city, otherwise known a king. It is also interesting to note that when it talks about the seventh king, it says that he will only rule for a short time. Well. It just so happens that Pope Benedict XVI is the first Pope to step down to resign in 600 years. Now I don't know how much validity I give to this St. Malachi prophecy, but it is just astounding of how well and precise the prophecy is, and how well it aligns with these eight kings as we see here, perfectly. But the point is, that if we are on the last Pope, in it's the year 2023, we're going into 2024 then that also just aligns very well with the timeline that we are in the final days here. And that is why I brought up this prophecy of St. Malachi. This prophecy, I must say, guys, is one of the 
best prophecies in the entire Bible. It is so amazing that it literally keeps me up at night sometimes when I just think about it. Just the astounding precision of accuracy predicting the first coming of Christ, which points to the second coming of Christ, down to the exact year, written several hundred years before Christ. One only has to look to the book of Daniel to see the prophecies God has given Daniel and their 100% accuracy. It is the pinnacle of God's sovereignty in the Bible, proving his existence through the sheer accuracy of these prophecies. In this part of the documentary, we're only going to go over the prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks, which is found in Daniel 9.24 to Daniel 9.27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. After threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The first step to decoding the prophecy of 70 weeks is to understand the meaning of week. In Hebrew, the original word means a period of seven and can also apply to days or years. A more literal translation of Daniel 9.24 would be 77s are determined. Now we can know that this period of 77s can't account for days, but has to account for years. This is because if it accounted for days, 70 weeks would only be about a year and four months. But the events that says that transpire during these 70 weeks are the restoring and rebuilding of Jerusalem, which took decades to do, and then the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which happened hundreds of years later after that. So it would make more sense for these 77s to account for years, which would equal a total of 70 times 7, which equals 490 years. Also, we know that this 70 week prophecy hasn't even fully been fulfilled yet because of some events that haven't even still taken place, like the last week of Daniel and also the end of all sin for thy people, as in the Jewish people. Now we have to do a little arithmetic to find the terminus for each of these decrees. The expression 70 weeks literally means 77s. And the year for a day principle applies here, as we can see in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 34, and the book of Ezekiel, chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now when we apply the day for a year principle to the seventy weeks, we get four hundred and ninety years. Now when you apply the four hundred and ninety years, to what has historically transpired, it fits perfectly, and thus fortifying further that each day equals a year in this prophecy. Now let us do a walkthrough of this prophecy, applying a day equaling a year, and by the end of this walkthrough, you'll without doubt know that a day in this prophecy equals one year. Daniel 9.24 the first verse in this prophecy is very important. It is the key to determining what the meaning of the prophecy is, the parameter of it all, who it's for, and if the prophecy has been completed or not. We can really find all these answers just in the first verse. 
as we read, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So we've already determined that a week just means a set of seven. So we apply that, 70 times 7 equals 490, and we apply the day as a year principle, 490 years. And as you see, I underlined thy people and thy holy city because thy just simply means your. So we can literally translate this verse to say, 490 years are determined upon the Israelites and upon Jerusalem to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now God has given us a list of six accomplishments that will be completed by the end of these 70 weeks. So it's basically saying these six accomplishments will take 70 weeks for them all to be fulfilled. And if we can determine if these 70 weeks haven't been completed, then we know that these six accomplishments haven't all yet been fulfilled. Let's also note that if these six accomplishments haven't all yet been fulfilled, then we could determine that the 70 weeks are not completed. This will help us later in our study of determining the 70th week. It's easy for people to misinterpret this prophecy, saying all these accomplishments have been completed by the work on the cross by Jesus Christ. But this just doesn't work for two reasons. The first being that this isn't a prophecy for all mankind as a whole, as in Gentiles and Jews. This is a prophecy specifically directed at the Jewish people and Jerusalem who have, as a majority, still reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. The second being that you would have to look at the work on the cross being at the middle point of the 70th week, which leaves three and a half years left to finish the last week in the prophetic timeline, basically in limbo. That just can't be right because God's prophecies are always 100% accurate. Now stay tuned as I show the sheer accuracy of this prophecy and why the 70th week hasn't started yet. Now let's look at these accomplishments one at a time. Now that we can look at them at face value in context, knowing that they are primarily directed towards the Jewish people and not the Gentiles or mankind as a whole. Number one, finish the transgression. This says the transgression itself will be finished. Taken literally, this means establishing an entirely new world order on earth with an end to the Jews' rebellion against God. And we know to this day that the Jews still transgress God by rejecting Jesus Christ. Number two, make an end of sins. Israel as a nation will go back into fellowship with God by accepting Jesus as their Messiah after the divine discipline of captivity. Number three, make reconciliation for iniquity. Man's iniquity must be reconciled to God's justice and holiness. This work has clearly been accomplished at the cross, but this also means the fullness of the Jewish people that come to Christ by the end of the 70th week. Number four, bring in everlasting righteousness. One might take this in an individual sense, but there has always been righteous individuals. For example, Abraham was made righteous by his faith. Taking the statement at face value, this means a new order of society brought in by the Messiah, where we will reign with Christ during the Millennial Kingdom. Number five, seal up vision and prophecy. God will seal this prophecy and others concerning Israel once the restoration at the second coming will fulfill God's covenant for Israel. Number six, anoint the most holy place. God will restore the Messiah to the restored temple. The anointing of this new temple is prophesied in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 46. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now to know the starting point of the 70 weeks we can see that it starts when the commandment goes forth to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now we just have to determine when that commandment was given. 
There are four decrees for the rebuilding of the temple and the city recorded in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. The first one is by King Cyrus in Ezra 1, but this decree is only for the rebuilding of the temple. The second decree is from King Darius in Ezra 6, but this is essentially just a renewal of the first decree given by King Cyrus. The third decree is given in Ezra 7. This decree is given by King Artaxerxes I. This is the first decree given for the rebuilding of the city. Some list a fourth decree based on what is recorded in Nehemiah 2. There is actually no printed decree mentioned here, but we can probably assume that Nehemiah was given some sort of orders of rebuilding the walls and the city, and this could be interpreted as a decree. We are going to focus on the third decree, since this is the first of the four that emphasizes the rebuilding of the city. So let us look at Ezra chapter 7, verses 12 to 24. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra, the priest, scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And whereas you were being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God which is in your hand, and whereas you are to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, and whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the freewill offering of the people and the priests, are to be freely offered for the house of their God in Jerusalem. Now, therefore, be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. And whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, do it according to the will of your God. Also, the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of your God deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay for it from the king's treasury. And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river, that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently, up to one hundred talents of silver, one hundred cores of wheat, one hundred baths of wine, one hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribed limit. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nethinim, or servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river, all such a know the laws of your God, and teach those who do not know them. First, the decree provides financial assistance to the priests and those involved in religious services and granted their ancient privileges by removing all obstacles to their work. Second, the decree also restores a certain amount of political and Judaical freedom to the Jews by giving Ezra the liberty to appoint civil officers to rule the people beyond the river with the Jewish law code. Third, the decree specified Artaxerxes' continued commitment to improving the appearance of the temple. Ezra wrote that God had put it in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem, Ezra 7, 27. The resulting decree restored religious and political freedom until both the temple and the city would be fully finished. Now that I know that it's the decree in Ezra 7, how do I know what year the decree was made? I know the answer. The answer is in Ezra 7 verse 7, which says, and I quote, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the potters, and the Nethiums, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. So the decree was made in the seventh year of Artaxerxes' reign. But when was the seventh year of Artaxerxes' reign? Uh, 
Artaxerxes ruled Persia from 465 to 424 BC. Therefore, the seventh year of his reign is none other than 458 BC. The dates of the rule of Artaxerxes are validated by many historians, including Herodias and Thucydides. So therefore you have it. The 70 weeks countdown started in 458 BC. As we look back to the verse of Daniel 9.25, we see that there are two events given. The first, to restore and build Jerusalem. The second, the Messiah coming. And then we also see that there are two time frames given. The first, seven weeks, and the second, three score and two weeks. Now let's put them together in the sequence that is given in the passage. Now as we put these together in the sequence given in the passage, we get the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem shall be seven weeks. Seven weeks, seven times seven equals 49. So we know that it was 49 years that it took them to restore and to build Jerusalem, which would have started in 458 BC and ended in 409 BC. Secondly, we get unto the Messiah the Prince, which shall be seven weeks. So the time that the temple took to be restored and rebuilt, 49 years, plus an additional and three score, two weeks. Three score is simply just 20 times three, which equals 60. So we get 62 weeks, 62 times seven, which equals 434. So we add those together, the 434 plus the 49 years, you get 483 years until the Messiah, the Prince. Now there is much debate about when the end of this 69 weeks is, when the Messiah the Prince comes. Some people like to speculate that it is either the baptism, and some others like to speculate that it is during his triumphal entry into Jerusalem right before he is crucified. We can easily determine if the end of the 69 weeks is either Jesus' baptism or his triumphal entry into Jerusalem just before his crucifixion by simply knowing what the word Messiah means. The definition of Messiah in Judaism and Christianity means anointed one. Jesus was anointed at baptism by the Holy Spirit when the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove, and Jesus began his messianic ministry. Therefore, we can conclude that the end of the 69 weeks started at his baptism in 26 AD. Now here is a timeline chart that I've illustrated to help give you better visualization of the 69 weeks of Daniel how it started from 458 BC to 26 AD. We can further fortify the prophecy of these 69 weeks by locking in the dates of 458 BC, which we already have done, and 26 AD. Now to confirm 26 AD is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we have to look no further than the scriptures. That's where we will always find our answer. Now let's begin to look at Luke chapter 3. Now, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip Tetrarch of Ituria and of the region of Traconitis, and Lysanias the Tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now we know John the Baptist started his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius' reign. Tiberius Caesar reigned from the years 14 AD to 37 AD. So if you were to add the 15 years to 14 AD, you would assume that John the Baptist's ministry started in 29 AD. But that's just not the case, because Tiberius Caesar was actually made co-emperor in the year 12 AD with Augustus. You'll notice through a little research that all historians agree that Tiberius Caesar's reign did start in 14 AD. And most theologians also agree with this date to fit their narrative. And that all makes sense through a worldview. But if we look at this through Luke's point of view, his perspective on the matter, we could see clues as what he meant by Tiberius' 15th year reign. Let's take a look back at the passage. Now let's look at this passage from Luke's point of view and what he's trying to convey. He lists several things that are happening in the same year that John the Baptist begins his reign. One thing that really stands out that I underline is that there's two high priests mentioned, Annas and Caiaphas. How could there be two high priests? We know that there is only one high priest. Well, Annas had only been high priest from the years of 6 AD to 15 AD, so why is he still mentioned in this time years later, years, years later? 
Well, there can only be one reason. While the Romans had removed him from office, yet he still wielded considerable power behind the scenes. Annas is still called High Priest even though he was not serving in the capacity of it at the time. Now why is Luke presenting it this way? Well, there can only be one answer, and that he's thinking of this as an actual situation, not merely a formal one. The actual situation was that both Annas and Caiaphas were both in the driver's seats during the entire period of John's ministry and during the length of Christ's ministry. Now I believe it is without a doubt and within reason that we can apply this same perspective to what Luke was looking at for Tiberius Caesar's 15th year of reign. That he was looking at the situation of him starting in 12 AD and not looking at the formal of 14 AD. So according to John, Tiberius' first year would have been 12 AD. Tiberius' 15th year then would have been 26 AD, as you see on this graph below. Because I had to put the graph because if you add 15 years to 12, it brings you to 27. But it's not 15 years after, it's in the 15th year, so therefore it would be 26 AD. John was six months older than Jesus, according to Luke 1.26. We know Jesus started his ministry at 30 years old, according to Luke 3.23. We know John was 30 when he started his ministry because it states in Numbers 4.3 that you can't be a priest officially doing service until you're 30 years old. This is why Jesus waited until he was 30 to be baptized by John and start his ministry. God confirms the age of 30 through appointed people by God in Scripture. Why would John, the one who prepares the way for Christ, be any different? Here are a few examples. Joseph was 30 years old when he became second in command to Pharaoh after being in prison as a slave in Egypt, Genesis 41 46. Saul became king when he was 30 years old, 1 Samuel 13, verse 1. Ezekiel was called by God as a prophet at age 30, Ezekiel 1 1. So John started his ministry at 30 years old in 26 AD. Jesus was most likely born in the fall. Many historians agree he was born around the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in September, October, for the feast meant God dwelling with us. John 1.14 says Jesus tabernacled with us, and that was at the same time of his baptism. As the scripture says, he started his ministry at about 30 years old. It is also interesting to know that this is when we are in the constellation Virgo, hence the virgin birth. Not that I'm promoting astrology or anything, but God did design the sun, moon, and stars to be a clock and calendar for the seasons and signs, so Jesus most likely began his ministry in the fall of 26 AD, six months after John. There is much more to support this, but we're not going to go in that for the sake of time. We do know by scripture that Jesus experienced four Passovers during his ministry, and also accomplished a lot before the first Passover, which means his ministry had to be longer than three years, but shorter than four years, as I will show in a timetable in a minute. Three and a half years of ministry again fits spiritually for a few reasons. Jesus was killed in the midst of the week, three and a half days, on a Wednesday, not on a Friday, which can be proven with just a few Bible verses that I'll explain in a later video. Also, the Antichrist ministry is three and a half years, as we see in Daniel 9, 27 and Revelations 13, 5. We know that the Antichrist is a counterfeit that copies Christ to mock him. As Jesus did his ministry, then died and was resurrected, the Antichrist mirrors it by getting a deadly head wound and then is healed, and then he begins his three and a half year reign. So Jesus begins his three and a half year ministry in the fall when he is filled with the Holy Spirit, and then three and a half years later, he is killed and resurrected around the time of Easter, Passover, and so that is most likely the time that the Antichrist will have his deadly head wound around Easter time, and it will be healed, resurrected, and that's when he has the embodiment of Satan, when Satan is cast out of heaven and goes into his body. And that's when Satan begins his three and a half year reign. So they mirror each other. So here's a timetable to give you a better visual of the three and a half year ministry. As you see, Jesus starts his ministry in the fall. Six months later, you get the Passover of John 2.13. And then the next Passover of John 5.1, which isn't explicit. But then if you read it in context, there's a lot to back it up that that was a Passover feast. And then the Passover of John 6 4, and then the Passover of John 11 55, which gives you a total of three and a half years from the time of his baptism to the time of his crucifixion and resurrection. 
now that we worked forward, providing a lot of information from the time of the beginning of the 70 weeks to show that Jesus was undeniably crucified in the year 30 AD. But if you are still in doubt, we can actually work backwards from the temple destruction of 70 AD to again show that it had to be 30 AD, as I will show you right here. The Torah mentions that the high priest had to cast lots to choose which goat went into the wilderness and which goat was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sins. But there's a long-standing Jewish tradition that provides a lot more detail. The Talmud tells us more about how the process of casting lots worked. There were two stones in a black bag. One stone was black, the other white. The black stone was the stone for Azazel, and the white stone was the lot for the Lord. Normally you'd have a 50-50 chance of pulling either the white or the black stone first. This is the law of averages. And our rabbis taught in the Talmud during the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the lot for the Lord, which is the white stone, did not come up in the right hand, nor did the crimson colored strap become white, nor did the western most light shine and the doors of the temple would open by themselves every night. So just to clarify, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atoning for Sins, would always occur in the end of September or October every year, and on that day they would either pull a black or a white stone. The black stone meaning that the Jews are not truly repentant. And so for 40 years they pulled the black stone, 40 years from the time after Jesus' crucifixion to the destruction of the temple. Now we know that the destruction of the temple was in the summer of 70 AD. So they weren't able to pull a stone in 70 AD because the destruction of the temple happened a couple months prior to the Day of Atonement. So the last stone pulled would have been in 69 AD. Now if you backtrack 40 years, 40 stones, it would bring you to the fall of 30 AD, which would have been six months after Jesus' crucifixion, the first Day of Atonement after Jesus' crucifixion. When you dial in from two different directions, and they both land on 30 AD, I'd say it's undeniable that we pinpointed 30 AD as the death and resurrection of Christ. Now you might be asking yourself, why is it so important to pinpoint the date of 30 AD as the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, it was only 50 days after that, where Pentecost happened, where the Holy Spirit came down and dwelled in the apostles which signified the beginning of the church age. There's a ton of evidence within the scriptures that hint towards the church age being only 2,000 years long. So from the time of Christ's death and resurrection to the time of his second coming when he returns for his bride being 2,000 years long. So you add 2,000 years to the year 30 AD, it brings you to the year 2030 AD, which we can conclude that there's a pretty good chance that Jesus Christ will return for his bride in the year 2030 AD. Now let me show you some of the evidence that sh points to a 2,000 year church age, 2,000 years from the time of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, to the, his second coming for his bride. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So if we apply the thousand years like a day principle to some of the things that happened in the Bible and some of the things that were said and written, then they begin to make a lot more sense. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, John 440. Now this has some serious implications because we know from scripture that Jesus for his ministry was only supposed to minister to the Jews and not to the Gentiles. But yet he went there for two days to minister to them. Now, let's look at a few Bible verses that show that Jesus was only here for the Jews during his earthly ministry. First, let's look at Matthew 15, verse 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And then also in Matthew 10, verse 5 to 6. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, do we think that Jesus was going against something that he taught to his disciples and something that he said that he would not do? But then he went and spent two days with the Samaritans, most likely ministering to them? No, everything Jesus did had a purpose. And this is the very reason that the two days that he spent with them 
day is a thousand years, that's two thousand years. So that's two thousand years of the church age for the Gentiles, two thousand years that he spends with the Gentiles. Hosea 6 verse 2, after two days he will revive us, in the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now this verse only makes sense if you apply that day as a thousand years. So after two thousand years he will revive us and in the third day he will raise us up. So after two thousand years that's when he's going to come back for his bride and we're going to be raised up and we shall live in his sight. Luke 13 32, and he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I shall be perfected. I think it's pretty clear here. He's talking about how two days he's doing his work, and on the third day he'll be perfected. He's not talking about being in the grave for three days and then him rising on the third day, because he's doing work. So obviously it's kind of hinting at the day is a thousand years, so two, two days that he's doing his work, two thousand years of the church age and then perfected on the third day, which would be him coming back for his bride, and we are put on new bodies and made like him. As we see on this chart again, Jesus comes on the fourth day, leaving day five and six after his coming. So 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham was work. 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus was work. And now it's 2,000 years from Jesus to his second coming, which is work. And then on the seventh day, we go into rest. When the Israelites were crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land, they were commanded to keep 2,000 cubits behind the Ark of the Covenant. In Scripture, the Jordan River often represents death, which is why both Jesus and John the Baptist were baptized there. The Jordan River also empties into the Dead Sea. There is a reason why the Lord commanded the Ark of the Covenant to be carried across the Jordan 2,000 cubits ahead of the rest of the people. The Ark represents Jesus, and the cubits represent years. This was a prophetic statement that the Lord would pass through death to his promised land 2,000 years before the rest of his people. 40 appears so often in contexts dealing with judgment or testing, many scholars understand it to be the number of probation or trial. This doesn't mean that 40 is entirely symbolic. It still has literal meaning in scripture. 40 days means 40 days. But it does seem that God has chosen that number to help emphasize times of trouble and hardship. Here are some examples of the Bible's use of the number 40 that stress the theme of testing or judgment. In the Old Testament, when God destroyed the earth with water, he caused it to rain 40 days and 40 nights. After Moses killed the Egyptian, he fled to Midian, where he spent 40 years in the desert tending flocks. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses interceded on Israel's behalf for 40 days and 40 nights. The law specified a number of lashes a man could receive for a crime, setting the limit at 40. The Israelite spies took 40 days to spy on Canaan. The Israelites wandered for 40 years. Before Samson's deliverance, Israel served the Philistines for 40 years. Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days before David arrived to slay him. When Elijah fled from Jezebel, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. The number 40 also appears in the prophecies of Ezekiel and Jonah. In the New Testament, Jesus was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. There were 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Now this part is my favorite. For a jubilee is every 50 years, and how many times does 50 go into 2,000 years? 40 times. So the church age goes through 40 jubilees. So as we just saw, 40, the number of trial of testing, and 40 jubilees of the probation period of grace. It gets even more amazing because what happened with Moses really is symbolic of the church age. For they were in Egypt, suffering affliction, and then Moses delivered them from Egypt. That's Christ dying on the cross, delivering us from our afflictions, delivering us from our sins. And then they wandered 40 years in the wilderness before they got to the promised land. So we wander 40 years in the wilderness, 40 jubilee years before we get to the promised land, heaven, our day of rest, the millennial kingdom, the new earth. Lastly, I would like to point out that Jesus spent 40 days with his people from his resurrection to his ascension in heaven. So, as he spent 40 days with them, he's spending 40 jubilees, again 2,000 years, with us, his people, the church age, before we get resurrected, as in raptured up, caught up, meet with him in the sky. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, 
and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So let's start off by breaking down this first verse. So in verse 26 of Daniel 9, it says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now, you may be thinking, okay, I thought after the 69 weeks, he that's when this baptism was. But now it's saying it's also when he was crucified. How could that be? How could he be baptized and crucified around the same time when we know his ministry was three and a half years long? Well, if you go back and look at verse 25, talking about from the time of the restoring and building of Jerusalem to the Messiah, it says unto, which means that it's exactly 69 weeks between those two. Now, in this verse, it says after. So this is any time after. Now let's go on to read. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So not for himself, he died for the sins of the world. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So who's the people of the prince that shall come? Well, it's interesting to note that in scripture that Jesus also refers to Satan as the prince and the prince to come. So the people referred to in verse 26 are the Romans, for it's the Romans who destroyed the temple, the sanctuary. And the prince to come, as we already know, is Satan himself, for he is the ruler of this world and rules over all the empires. And as we saw in John 12, 31, Jesus referred that the prince to come is Satan. So looking back at verse 26, with the Messiah being killed and the sanctuary being destroyed, these are in conjunction with each other. So it is saying that both these happened after the 62 weeks. And we know that these things happened 40 years apart from each other, which means that these things didn't happen immediately after the 62 weeks, but it was just some time after. The end of Jerusalem will come with a flood, which seems to be figurative language describing the complete destruction that washed over the city in 70 AD. To the end of Jerusalem's destruction, there will be war and desolations. The city and the temple were in rubble when the Romans were finished with their assault. The Roman destruction of Jerusalem was an event of the Jewish wars that spanned from 67 to 73 AD. These wars ended when the Roman army built a siege ramp and conquered the last of the Jewish zealots. Now let's go over the most misunderstood verse of this prophecy, which I'm hoping to shed some light on. Daniel 9:27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. A lot of the confusion that arises from this passage is that a lot of people th seem to think that the one that makes this covenant is Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ had a three and a half year ministry and then at the midpoint he was cut off. So three and a half years in, th it's three and a half days, which is half a week, um, he's cut off and he is the final sacrifice. There's no longer a need of the old system of sacrificing goats, rams, and lambs. But he is the Lamb of God. He is the final sacrifice. So I completely understand the confusion that people have when you look at the surface of this passage. But if you look deeper into it, we can clearly see for several reasons why it can't be talking about Jesus Christ. The fact that it starts off by saying he means that they're not done talking about the previous person mentioned. And the previous person mentioned was the prince that shall come. Next we see that he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And many people try to say that this covenant is the covenant that Jesus Christ made with grace by dying on the cross for us, a new covenant. But this cannot be so because Jesus' covenant is everlasting. And this is only for one week, this covenant that it speaks of. And it says that this covenant is with many. But Jesus died for everyone, he died for the sins of the whole world. And if you want to look at it the other way, there can't be many as well because it is only few that find the road to life. It is also interesting to note that it separates the 69 weeks from the one week. For the 62 weeks and the 7 weeks are put together, as in they happen consecutively, but it mentions the last week separate from it, as if there's some sort of interlude in between them, and that would be the 2000 year church age. 
And if this verse was talking about Jesus Christ, then what happened to the second three and a half years? It just never got completed to complete the last week? No, it doesn't really make sense, does it? And he causes the sacrifice and ablation to cease, but that's not what happened. After Jesus Christ died, the Jews continue to do sacrifices. Even in the millennial kingdom where we reign with Christ, God commands the people to do sacrifices so they don't cease. If it was talking about Jesus Christ, the proper term to be used wouldn't be cease, it would be nullified, void. If it were talking about Jesus, then the several promises for the Jews that would be completed within the 70 weeks would be complete. But the matter of the fact is that they aren't complete. A lot of the Jews still do not believe that he's the Messiah. So the 70 weeks can't be complete, which means the last week can't be Jesus Christ's covenant. Now let's continue. Now the last part of verse 27 really clears things up because the last part is also part of this last week, specifically the second half after the sacrifices cease, after the midpoint. And it goes on to say, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. In Daniel 11.31, it backs this up by saying, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now who gave a warning about this? That would be Jesus. Jesus gave a warning about this, where he said in Matthew 24.15, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who in Judea flee to the mountains. And we know that this isn't talking about what happened in 70 AD because this is actually covered in scripture and also Revelations chapter 12, where it talks about the woman fleeing into the wilderness to be protected for uh, three and a half years, which is interesting because that's half of a week. And it also talks about when this is happening that it, it will be the most troublous times that the world has ever seen. Now that we have reached near the end of this documentary, let's get into the meat of this documentary. What everything in this video has been pointing towards and that is the last week of Daniel. So let's go over how the last week of Daniel happens and when it happens. First we'll cover the how. So how does the last week of Daniel begin? I believe that can be answered by a problem that stands in the way and that is the third Jewish temple because currently at the Temple Mount stands the Alaska Mosque. So I believe some conflict will break out where the Alaska Mosque is destroyed and then a peace treaty is made and Israel can rebuild their third Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. These three scriptures support a third Jewish temple during Daniel's last week. And they are as follows. Reading from 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Next one is, So when you see, standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, and let those who in Judea flee into the mountains. It's Matthew 24, 15, 16, also in Mark 13 and Luke 21. And lastly, we see, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Revelations 11, verse 1 to 2. Now there are three Bible prophecies that I believe will be fulfilled just prior to the last week of Daniel, and will initiate that final one-week covenant. The first of those three prophecies is Isaiah 17, where it speaks of the destruction of Damascus, destroyed in a single night, and is a ruinous heap, no longer inhabitable. We know that has never happened, so that still has to happen. And the next is Jeremiah 49, speaking of the prophecy of Elam, where God destroys the bow of Elam um, of its greatest might. And so Elam is placed in Iran's southern western part of Iran, where all its nuclear facilities are, and everything going on with Israel and Iran, and Iran trying to build a nuclear bomb to wipe Israel off the map it seems to be gearing towards that. And it's also interesting in Jeremiah 49 that it also talks about the destruction of Damascus by fire. And last but definitely not least, we have the Psalm 83 war, which I find the most interesting. Now this talks about a confederation of 10 places slash peoples that get together and they want to wipe Israel off the map. 
And it just so happens that these 10 places slash people are the bordering people around Israel. So you got Jordan, Hamas, Hezbollah, Assyria, and the list goes on. And they, they come together and they want to wipe Israel off the map. And it's just interesting because as we see in the world today, that seems to be gearing up with the conflicts that are going around with Israel. The reason I find the Psalm 83 war so interesting is because the Ezekiel 38 war, the Gog Magog battle that happens after the Psalm 83 war, in this battle of Ezekiel 38, it talks about an outer ring of nations that come against Israel. But if this outer ring of nations comes against Israel, why wouldn't the inner ring join them? Well, that's because Israel in the Psalm 83 war defeats this inner ring, and by doing so, it initiates this peace treaty, the beginning of the last week, the one week covenant, and through that covenant that is made after the Alaska Mosque probably being destroyed in that battle, it allows Israel to begin the construction of their third Jewish temple at the beginning of the one week covenant. Now let's spend some time and focus on Matthew 24, for everything that Jesus spoke about in the Olivet Discourse happens within the last week of Daniel. And we can support this by tying in other scriptures, but we're going to mainly focus on Matthew 24, for it is the core outline of the seven year tribulation. Now I want to draw your attention to some correlations between Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation chapter 6, talking about the seven seals. So starting off in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 24, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of the coming of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. So going to chapter 6 of Revelation, starting verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So this is the Antichrist rising to power at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. He starts. This is when he starts that peace treaty, that one-week covenant. He's going to come as a man of peace, obviously false peace, and he's going to be somewhat of a messiah figure to the world. Like a Christ-like figure, so a false Christ. Now moving on to the next one in Matthew 24 verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. So going on to the second seal, um, Revelation chapter 6 verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So you may have heard of peace and safety in the news a lot because it's signaling towards this coming. But as you saw, this man of peace coming and starting the peace treaty, that's a false peace because right after the, the second seal, he takes peace from the earth. So when they say peace and safety, then some destruction will come, as it talks about in First Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 3. Now let's move on. Matthew 24, verse 7 to 8. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now this is kind of covering the third and fourth seal. Let's go on to read those. Uh, verse 5, chapter 6, Revelations. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be the voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and a third quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So this is talking about an economic crash, because if you do the calculations, denarius back then was about a day's wages. So it was about a day's wages for a quart of wheat, which is about a loaf of bread. And then going on in verse 7, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. Now we go on to Matthew 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray and because lawlessness will be increased the love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved and this is the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come so that's obviously talking about the fifth seal where we read 
in chapter 6 of Revelations, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves have been. Now I find it interesting that he tells them to wait a while because it kind of makes it sound like that this seal is going to, going to be prolonged. So we see the, the first four seals happening, which I believe be happening in the first three and a half years of the tribulation and the fifth seal probably starting in that, but the fifth seal is going to carry on for a lot of the second half of the great tribulation. So verses three to 15 in Matthew are covering basically the first half of the seven year tribulation. And now verses 15 to 28 are basically just covering all the events at the midpoint, seeing how that's a big turning point in the seven year tribulation. As we go from beginning of birth pains, beginning of sorrows into the great tribulation. Now let's look at the sixth seal covered in Matthew 24. Verse 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now that's the sixth seal. So let's go look at what the sixth seal has to say in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was re removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? And here are three other Bible passages that tie in with it. Acts 2.17 and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then in 2 Joel 2, 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now also in Isaiah uh, 13, starting at verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun will be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. From these five correlating verses, we can determine several things. First being at the sixth seal, Jesus returns in the clouds to gather together his elect, also known as the rapture, the catching away, where we get new bodies, we change in the tinkling of an eye, become like him, and we go up for the wedding feast. And then the next is that the day of the Lord refers to when God pours out his wrath. Next is that God's wrath follows right after the seven seals. So that means that the seven trumpets and seven bowls are God's wrath, which also means that the seals are not God's wrath. Also that God pours out his spirit and miraculous things happen, leading to others to salvation just prior to the rapture. And lastly, that Jesus doesn't return for his bride until sometime after the midpoint of the tribulation. And now we can also back up this last claim with another verse. 2 Thessalonians 2 Now we beseech you, brethren, 
by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So that's the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And this is how he's revealed in verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So just to sum things up there, there's two things that have to happen before Jesus Christ returns. That's the great falling away, the apostasy, and then the son of perdition revealing himself, which is at the midpoint of the tribulation. Going to Matthew 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. So that's the falling away. Down in verse 15, we see um, where he reveals himself. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So that's him revealing himself. Because they see him standing there like, oh man, this this isn't the Messiah. This is a false Messiah. We need to flee. We need to run. They've been awakened. And then after this is when uh, it talks about Jesus coming in the clouds and gathering together his elect in verse 29. So clearly we can see a good outline of a falling away first, the son of perdition revealing himself, that's at the midpoint, where he ends the daily sacrifice and goes into the temple, setting up the abomination of desolation, which caused the Jews to wake up and realize who he truly is. So that's him being revealed at the midpoint and the Jews flee into the mountains. And then at some point after that, Jesus returns. So what we do know is that Jesus returning for his bride, the rapture, won't happen until some time after the midpoint. Now, does that mean that Jesus Christ will return immediately after the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation? I don't think so. I think scripture makes it perfectly clear that we will be here for the second half of the seven-year tribulation. As we see in Revelations chapter 13, verses 5 and 7, power was given unto the beast to continue 42 months, so that's three and a half years, and it was given unto the beast to make war against the saints and to overcome them. Daniel 12, verse 7, it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And then when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. We also see in Daniel 7:25, He shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. So a time equals a year, so that adds up to three and a half years. Now, how do we know that this is talking about the second half of the seven-year tribulation? Well, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, so that happens at the midpoint, then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains because they're going to be protected there, right? So we see a correlation of this also in Revelations chapter 12 where it speaks of the devil being cast down to the earth and comes down with great wrath knowing that his time is short because he only has three and a half years left. He knows the allotted time. And it says, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman, that are, that's the Jews, but then they're, but he can't get them. They're protected for three and a half years. It says a time, times, and half a time. They're protected in the wilderness. So then it says that he goes after the offspring of the woman, and those are them that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we can also conclude that Matthew 24, verse 15, where it talks about the abomination of desolation being set up, is the midpoint of the seven year tribulation because in daniel 9 27 it talks about the daily sacrifice being taken away at the midpoint of the last week and if you go to daniel 11 31 it talks about these two events happening at the same time as we see in daniel 11 31 and forces shall be mustered by him and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress and they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation so that makes it clear that this three and a half years that it keeps talking about is talking about the second half of the seven year tribulation. Also, I'd like to point out in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. Also, we see the mentioning of the great tribulation also in Revelations chapter 7, where it talks about a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all the tribes and people of languages standing before the throne of the Lamb clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands. And an, an, an angel, or an elder, sorry, asks, who are these clothed in the white robes? And he says, these are them that came out of great tribulation. So to be coming out of the great tribulation, you need to be in the great tribulation. 
Also, if we go back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 22, we see it says, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So I don't think we'll be here for the entire second half of the seven-year tribulation. I think it's going to follow the same outline that we see in the Bible with six days of creation, and then the seventh day God rested. 6,000 years of man's work, and then 1,000 years where we rest with Christ. And then there's the sabbatical cycle, which is six years of work, and then the seventh year is a sabbatical year. I think it'll be the same, where we go through six years of the tribulation, and the beginning of the seventh year, we are caught up in the sky, meet Jesus in the sky, that's the rapture, and we go up to heaven, we're clothed in our white robes, we have the wedding feast, and at this same time, that's when the day of the Lord is happening, where the wrath of God is being poured out on the earth, as in the seven um, trumpets and the seven bowls, and then we come back with Jesus Christ at the end of the seven years to set up the millennial kingdom. Now, the reason why I say the day of the Lord is a year long, as in the seventh year of the seven-year tribulation, where he pours out his wrath, are two scriptures where God puts out punishment and he gives it out as a day for a year as we see in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6 and when you have completed them lie again on your right side and then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days I have laid on you a day for each year numbers 14 34 according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land 40 days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year namely 40 years and you shall know my rejection now the real question is, is when does this last week of Daniel begin? Before I get started, I'd like to make a little disclaimer. I'm only human, I can make mistakes, and that I'm not date setting. I'm not saying it is going to be on this day for sure. I'm just making an educated guess with the data that has been given. And if I'm wrong, it's not going to be more than a couple of years, because there's still all these things happening around these times. So the final seven years will be from the fall of 2024 to the fall of 2031 with the midpoint being the spring of 2028 why does the last week of daniel start and end in the fall well that is because the sabbatical year the jewish new year starts and ends in the fall so it will follow suit with that and it's also interesting to note that the 69 weeks ended in the fall when jesus was baptized the 69 weeks didn't end in the spring during his triumphal entry right before he was crucified, as some like to believe. It just doesn't work with the sabbatical week cycle. Now there are four dates that really lock in the year 2024 to 2031 as the last seven years. First is 2017, which gives us plenty of signs pointing towards what's coming. Revelation 12 sign, uh, Trump moving the embassy to Jerusalem and recognizing it as the capital, Trump creating the temple coin, 2017 solar eclipse, and Judah ben Samuel's prophecy of the starting of the messianic era beginning in 2017. Now what happened with Joseph in Egypt where he had seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. I think that's a foreshadowing of what was going to happen in the future as in now for 2017 to 2024 is seven years so that's our seven years of warning where we had all our warnings and then seven years from 2024 to 2031 that's our seven years of tribulation so it kind of mirrors that. The next date to look at is the spring of 2028, for that's the midpoint of Daniel's last week, which is exactly 80 years from Israel being reborn in the spring of 1948. Let's look at the parable of the fig tree. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and it puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So what this is saying is that from the time that the fig tree is planted, which is Israel being reborn, to the time of its full blossom, which is the fullness of the Jews coming to the knowledge of the truth and escaping into the mountains, will not be greater than a generation, which is 80 years. Well, that 80-year window ends on May 14th, 2028. In my timeline, it puts all these things completed by April 2028. So really, the midpoint of the last week of Daniel cannot be later then May 14th, 2028, and therefore the seven-year tribulation has to start in 2024. All these things that is mentioned in the parable, it's not talking about everything prior to the parable of the fig tree in Matthew 24, but it's talking about everything in Matthew 24 prior to verse 29, talking about Jesus coming in the clouds. 
because it separates all these things from Jesus coming in the parable. Now, last but not least, looking at the year 2030, the year projected for Jesus Christ to return for his bride, also known as the rapture, fits perfectly because it's exactly 2,000 years after Christ dying on the cross. And when you tie it in with this seven-year timeline of 2024 to 2031, it's exactly a year before the end of it, which gives enough time for the day of the Lord. Now, you might start beginning to see how all of this just fits together so well, just all these dates perfectly in tune with one another. But it even gets more crazy as I'm about to show you this next chart how everything just fits together so perfectly. Now before I show you it, I just want to clarify again that I am not date setting. I'm not saying I know it will happen on this day. I'm just simply providing the evidence. Now where even to begin? There's a lot actually going on inside this chart here. Now with this set of seven years, with the 1290 days and the 1260 days, I've tried to fit that in with other sets of seven years. And nothing even came close to fitting like this. For this doesn't just fit well, it fits perfectly. Now first you got the Feast of Trumpets, the Jewish New Year, on October 3rd, 2024. So it makes sense for the beginning of the last week to start in the Jewish New Year. You add 1290 days to it. It brings you to Saturday Sabbath in the middle of Passover week on April 15th, 2028. And then you add another 1260 days to that. It brings you exactly to the Day of Atonement on September 27th, 2031 which is just kind of funny because September 27th is 927 and Daniel 927 it talks about this last week. It's also interesting to note that the Feast of Trumpets of 2030 and the Day of Atonement of 2031 both land on September 27th, which make them exactly a year apart to the day, giving an exact time for the Day of the Lord. Now for these two Jewish holidays to be exactly a year apart to the day, that only happens once every three to four years. Now you add that in with this seven year timeline of 1290 days and 1260 days fitting perfectly where it doesn't fit in any other seven year cycle anywhere in the calendar. That just makes this seven year timeline even more rare, astronomically rare. Now I use these fall feast dates for a specific reason for the start and end date of the seven year tribulation. And that is because when Jesus first came, he fulfilled the first four feasts of the seven feasts of the Lord. And he still has to fulfill the last three feasts, that being the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. As Colossians 2.17 puts, these are the shadows of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So these, these feasts were a shadow of things to come. And that's why they've been always celebrated. But they have to be fulfilled, as you saw Jesus fulfilled the first four. And if they're found in Christ, he's going to come and he's going to fulfill the last three. Now, it makes sense for Jesus to return at the Feast of Trumpets because it talks about trumpets being sounded when he returns. As we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, it also says, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And also, if Jesus returns at the sixth seal, or just after the sixth seal, well, it's the seven trumpet judgments that follow immediately after. Now, the Day of Atonement is the holiest day of the year, known as the Day of Awe. It is the day of purification and cleansing. Now, it would make sense for Jesus to actually return on this day as his second coming when he steps down on the earth on the Mount of Olives because it says that he comes to judge and make war as in purify and cleanse the land to set up his millennial kingdom. And lastly and most obvious the Feast of Tabernacles which can also be called the Feast of Dwellings for tabernacle means to dwell is going to be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom for we shall dwell with the Lord for a thousand years and forevermore. Also remember how all the Tetrad blood moons landed on Passover and Sukkot which is the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, Passover is the first feast, as you can see, and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles is the last feast. So, just as God said, He is the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega. He declared the end from the beginning. Wow. Now back to this chart with the middle date of the April 15th, 2028. It actually fits really well, because what day would be more inappropriate to set up the abomination of desolation other than the Saturday Sabbath during the Passover week? Which makes me want to bring your attention to another chart that makes this middle date fit even more perfectly. Here I want to show you how the Antichrist mirrors Christ as a counterfeit mockery. So just as there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the Holy Trinity, well, Satan likes to copy as there's the dragon, the Antichrist, as the first beast, 
and the false prophet as the second beast spoken about in Revelation. So that's the unholy false trinity that he's making. And it's also interesting that Jesus has a three and a half year long ministry. And then the Antichrist in the final days is given authority for 42 months for three and a half years as well. So again, mirroring each other. So seeing how these two mirror each other like that, it would also make sense that if Jesus died and is resurrected at Passover, that the Antichrist will die and be resurrected also at Passover. And we know that the Antichrist, also known as the first beast, is killed and resurrected, or at least appears to be, as we see in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Also down in verse 12 of the same chapter, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Now how will all of this play out? Let's review Revelation chapter 12, starting at verse 7, and you'll see how it plays out. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now I don't think this has happened yet, as we'll see further on, that Satan still has access to heaven, which means this war happening with him being cast out, has not happened yet. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So who is he accusing? He's accusing Christians. So this is obviously after Christ came, because Christendom didn't happen until after Christ. And see how it says accused, not accuses? So the casting down happens after this accusing day and night and we can also back this up in job chapter 1 starting in verse 6 that satan still has access to heaven now there was a day when the sons of god came to present themselves before the lord and satan which also means accuser also came among them the lord said to satan from where have you come satan answered the lord and said from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it and the lord said to satan have you considered my servant job so he mentions job which means this is post fall and it says that he came from the earth, so he's not on the earth, which means he's up in heaven. So as you can see, Satan still has access to heaven. Now let's continue on in Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of earth and of sea, for the devil is coming down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Before Satan's demise, there's an allotted amount of time that he's given. That's the three and a half years that he's given authority. So it makes sense when it says that he comes down with great wrath, knowing that his time is short. He knows how much time is left. So that's, again, pointing towards the midpoint. And then continuing on in verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he pursued the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now we know the protection of this woman, also known as the Jews, takes place after the midpoint, when the abomination of desolation is set up for three and a half years. So when it says that when he was cast down, he pursued after the woman, where she was protected for three and a half years in the wilderness, that means he must have been cast down just right at the midpoint and then pursued after the woman, but the woman was protected for the three and a half years. So now we can paint a picture of how all this is going to play out. At the beginning of the seven years, when the peace treaty is made by some evil man, obviously a Satan worshipper, he's going to rise to power, and then at the midpoint, he will be killed. And that's also at the midpoint when Satan is cast out of heaven and comes down with great wrath. He goes into this body and resurrects this body of this man, this evil man, and that would be Satan in the flesh as towards a mockery of God in the flesh, who is Jesus Christ. And then going on from there, He'll continue to have authority for three and a half years, as the Bible says, where he'll go after the Jews, but they're protected in the wilderness for three and a half years. So he goes after the Christians instead, persecuting and wearing down the saints in the Most High. And this time, this is also when he'll be implementing the Mark of the Beast. This is where also the persecution will come, because if you don't receive the Mark, you will be persecuted. If you don't worship the image of the Beast, the Abomination of Desolation, you will be persecuted. And then two and a half years in, at the beginning of the seventh year, the time will be cut short for the elect's sake, and that will be where Jesus Christ comes in the clouds and raptures us out. And we go to heaven as we see in Revelations chapter 19 for the wedding feast. And we get clothed in white robes. 
during this time is when God's wrath will be poured out, which is the seven trumpet judgments and the seven bowls of wrath upon the earth. And then at the end of the seven years, Jesus returns to the earth, us with him, and he comes to judge and make war, landing on the Mount of Olives and setting up his millennial kingdom. So there you have it, with the midpoint being April 15th, 2028, the Saturday Sabbath Passover. And we know that Satan comes down at the midpoint to pursue after the woman. It would make sense that the death and resurrection of the Antichrist would happen at Passover, the same as Christ, which is the midpoint. So as you see, these dates just all fit so well in this timeline. Now, just to wrap up this documentary, as we see in April 15th, 2028 to September 27th, 2031 is exactly 1260 days apart, which fits with the 1260 days, which is 42 months that the Antichrist is given authority to rule. How would that make sense if in Daniel 12, 11, it says from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. I believe this scripture is telling us that 30 days before the abomination of desolation is set up, the daily sacrifice will be abolished, which makes it fit the 1290 days. Now with compiling everything in this documentary and comparing these two charts, this one here and this one here, everything fits like a glove. Scripture says, know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Now that we've reached the end of this documentary, I just want to make a few things clear, a few main questions that I usually get and that I just want to also clarify again that I am not date setting in any kind of way. I'm not saying Jesus is coming on a specific day. Um, I do believe that no man knows the day or the hour, but that specifically is talking about the day of the Lord, the day that Jesus returns for his bride and the wrath of God is being poured out. No one knows that when that exactly happens and starts. But we can know the season of when that's coming and we can know probably when the seven year tribulation is going to be because there's a lot in scripture as you've seen in this documentary that really lays it out clear but what i said also about the day of the lord him coming six years in at the beginning of the seventh year i'm not saying that's how it's exactly going to happen either that's just an educated guess again as well i do believe that Jesus is returning, obviously, in the second half of the seven-year tribulation, most likely near the end, if not the very end. It could be at the end of the seven years. So, again, I am not date-setting the day of the Lord. I am not saying Jesus is returning on this day or that day, but I do know through Scripture that we can know that there's still things that have to be fulfilled before Christ comes and that we can know the season of his coming when it's going to be very near at the door. Um, and then another thing is people say is that I'm preaching doom and gloom, which I do not think so. I think it's pretty clear as a Christian that studies prophecy or any Christian that studies prophecy that it's exciting, you know, like Jesus is returning soon. And when we see that he, his coming is approaching and we can see that, oh, it's on the horizon, that's very exciting because we know that we're going home soon. We know that we're going to be with the Lord soon. And so it's an exciting thing. Sure. We're going to go through some difficult times before we get there. But if you're really walking with the Lord, you're going to rejoice in your sufferings, as the Bible says. So it's not a doom and gloom preaching. And also the people that don't believe they need to hear this message. So it is very important. And another thing that people tell me is, oh, studying end times, that's not important. You should focus on the gospel and love and and grace and all that. And that's very true. You should focus on those things and it should be like the core of your belief, but that doesn't negate the rest of the Bible. You like, it's, that's just looking at a one-sided coin. Like you, you got to look at both sides of the picture. You got to look at all the scripture. You got to study it all. Just as you think the appendix does nothing, 
um, well, guess what? The appendix does something. And so just because you think scripture is not important, that's a part of the body of Christ. It's, it's all important. And why would there be 150 chapters talking about end times? And um, most of Bible prophecy is about the times that are about to come upon us. And if we truly are the tribulation saints, and we're going to go through this, don't you think that means this part of the Bible is very important for us to study? If you look in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, he also tells us to keep watch, to look for these signs, because he gives a list of things to look for as they ask, what is going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And then the Lord gives a list, and at the very end, in verse 42, he says, Therefore, stay awake, keep watch. For you do not know what day your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not let his house be broken into. So yeah, we we need to keep watch, as Jesus put it. And so studying this stuff is very important. And then in Revelations chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So, as you can see, it's very important to study these things. And and another reason why it's important is because also a lot of Christians believe that, you know, we're going to be raptured out before the seven-year tribulation happens. We're not going to go through any of this. It's we're going to be all good. It's don't need to worry. Well, that is a false doctrine. That is so false. And I'm scared for the people in the church that believe this, because when this time comes and they go through all this, they're, they're going to be like, what, where's the Lord's coming? And they're going to fall away. The, the scripture says that that's what they're going to say, that they're going to be questioning about the Lord's coming because they thought he was going to come. And then persecution is going to come upon them. And Jesus said, there's going to be a great falling away. So we need to prepare our hearts, as also you see in Luke uh, chapter 21, verse 34. I'll read it here for you. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place. And to stand before the Son of Man. So we the rapture is not going to happen at the beginning. As I made clear in the documentary. We are going to go through the tribulation. Sure, we're not going to go through the wrath of God. But we're going to go through the wrath of Satan. We're going to go through persecution. The wearing down of the saints and the Most High. So if you are a lukewarm Christian. Living half-heartedly. And just going to church on Sundays then when persecution comes, you're not going to be ready. And there's a good chance that you can fall away. And, and you know, I would say that every Christian would probably say, oh, that's not me. It's not going to be me. I'm not going to fall away. But if every Christian says that, but the scripture says there's a great falling away, then we need to be careful and make sure we're walking strongly with the Lord so we don't end up being one of those people. You know, you can't just put it in the blinder and be like, no, no, that's not going to be me. You need to be like, okay, there's a, this is coming. We're going through this and I need to prepare myself. I need to get my walk right with the Lord. He's made it very clear and evident that his return is right at the door, very near. And also the church in China in the 1950s, they went through heavy persecution and about two thirds of the church fell away. And why is that? Well, that, that, Back then, the church, they didn't preach the persecution of the church. They didn't preach what it cost to be a disciple and how many will be hated for his namesake. They didn't preach that side. They only preached the, the grace, health and wealth part of the gospel, the love, you know, which is important. But because they weren't preaching the other half, they weren't prepared. They didn't expect that to come. They expected only peace and joy. And, you know, when you are fully walking with the Lord, sure, yeah, you, you're going to rejoice in your sufferings, but you have to know that you are going to go through persecution. The Bible says there is going to be persecution in this world, so we need to be prepared for that.
Now, for those that are not saved, I believe that you're probably kind of blown away from everything that you've seen in this documentary. You might have thought in your whole life that, you know, the Bible's a fairy tale and it's just full of stories and fables. But after seeing this documentary, you're probably seeing it, how everything just aligns so well and so perfectly. And the signs and the sun, moon and stars and the events going on in the world that, you know, this, this book is real. It's alive, right? So you're probably wanting to know what it means to be saved and what the gospel means. The gospel means the good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And we need to be born again. That's how you get saved because your spirit is dead. And to be born again, that, that's by accepting Jesus Christ into your heart so he can revive you, bring you back to life. And because how it works is Jesus isn't looking for a perfect person to do or someone just to do good works. He's looking for you to be, to understand that you are a sinner, that you're broken and that the wages of sin is death and that you need him and that the, the death that you deserved, he paid for. He paid that penalty for us. And so he wants you just to accept him into your heart. And when you accept him into your heart, then he will begin to change your heart. So those things that you love now, as you come towards the Lord, he will make, he'll change you to make you love the things you hate and hate the things that you love. And you become a new person moving from glory to glory through the process of sanctification. The ABCs of the gospel is A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. And C, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. So that's the basics of salvation there. And, you know, prayer, it's not a certain formula. God's not looking for you to say certain things in a certain way to him at a certain time or anything like that. God reads heart. He's not looking at your words. So don't try to think that you need to figure out how you're going to say it or write a script or something. Just speak from the heart. Tell the Lord that you're a sinner. Tell him that you recognize that you're you're broken and that you need him because you know salvation what it is it's it's all about trusting in him that's what faith is it's trusting that i need the lord and and then what you need to do is also ask him into your heart so that he can come in and live inside you and begin to change you as i just explained and repent for repentance means to have a change of mind so you need to change your mind about what you think and and start believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and call upon his name and you will be saved, you know? And there's a few scriptures I can share with you just to clarify the way of salvation. Romans 3.23, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So we're all owed death for our sin. But the free gift, free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we put on Christ's righteousness. We cannot be righteous on our own. We, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. It Bible even says our good deeds are as filthy rags. So we need to put on Christ's righteousness. We're saved through him. And then Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Because, you know, that's a, one of the biggest sins is pride. Everything really stems from pride. That's how we fell in the first place. And how Satan fell in the first place was it's pride thinking that we don't need God. I can do it on my own. Um, because if you go to heaven and you say, look at me, I'm so righteous. I've I made it here on my own. I, I'm a good person then you're boasting. That's that's pride. That's a sin. <laughs> so, yeah, you, it's just, it just doesn't work that way. You need God. That's the, the whole point of salvation is to, to humble yourself before the Lord. For God says that he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Moving on, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 5, 8, God shows his love 
for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And then just to move forward, it's also important to know that when you pray and ask him into your heart, you can't just continue on living your life how you did before with no change. Because the Bible makes it quite clear in James chapter 2 that um, true faith produces works. So you're saved by faith, and that will produce works. So if you don't see a change in your life, I would I would second guess your faith. And, you know, the Bible says in Corinthians 13, 5 to test your faith. And then also in John 14, 21, the one who obeys me is the one who loves me. And because he loves me, my father will love him and I will too. And I will reveal myself to him. You know, you just got to seek the Lord with your whole heart and he will reveal himself to you. You know, like even wise men still seek him as the Bible puts it. We never stop seeking him. We want to know him. The whole point is to have a relationship with God that's continually seeking him. That's the relationship. It's all about relationship. It's not about religion. And lastly, I just want to say, you know, Jesus preached more about hell than anyone. People always talk about Jesus's love and grace and that. And then again, once again, that's a one-sided Jesus. Jesus preached hell more than anyone. Because you know what? Telling people about hell is not a judgment that you're putting upon them. You're trying to warn them. Because it's when you tell someone about hell, that's love. Because you're trying to say, hey, I don't want you to go there. This is the way out. You're trying to pull them out of the fire. So I, I got to say that, you know, today is the day of salvation. You could die tomorrow. You could die tonight. So I wouldn't put this off. I would, if you want to be saved, I would reach out now. Don't put it off because that's all it takes is you just need to be born again and then you will be saved, you know, to the saved and unsaved. We need to get our lives right because when we go through this persecution, we're going to need God. So you need to not be a foolish virgin. You need to get the oil in your lamp. Be ready. Be prepared for what's about to come upon the face of the earth. You know, because like I said, there is a great falling away that is coming that Jesus warned about himself. And, you know, people preach this once saved, always saved doctrine as well. But if Jesus said that there is a falling away, how do you fall away from something if you were never in it? So, and why do you give so much warning about it? There's 80 warnings in the Bible about falling away. So, I'm just going to say, if you're not fully there, if you're walking as a lukewarm Christian, this is your warning. This is your final warning. And we don't have much time left. So you, it's, you need to take action now. Get your life right. You know, um, soften your heart. Stop hardening your heart so that the Lord can give you strength in that time of need, as we saw in Luke 21, verse 34. And so all I could say is... uh. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. God bless everyone.